Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all those present and tuning in for our lecture. We are uh, in the presence of someone who is an extremely busy individual. I will keep my introduction very short in order to not eat upon his time. But before I do so, I would like to speak a few words about the Center for UN Studies, which is expertly spearheaded by Professor Dr. Weslin Popowski, the Center for UN Studies, which aims to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits on of the UN by enhancing research and building knowledge on how the UN system works, both in terms of institutional development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. The center fits well with the global vision and aspirations of the law school and of the university. A sister organization of the Center for UN Studies is the Jindal Society of International Law. It is a student-led initiative and is supported widely by the professors of this university. The center was inaugurated by the Herbert and Rose Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Alvarez of New York University, along with the Vice Chancellor, Professor Siraj Kumar, the Dean of the Law School, the Vice Dean of the Law School, Professor Dr. Wesley Popowski, and a very dear friend of the Center and of the Society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. Our four lecture series of 2021, Exploring the Ecosystem of International Law, builds upon the introduction given on internationalism and international law by the concluded spring lecture series titled Future of Internationalism and International Law. The fall series endeavors to study the different contours of international law. To assist in the study, the speakers will cover and address their respective areas of expertise based upon their years of research and practice. Given the vast ecosystem and engagement of international law of the speakers, we wish to study and learn from them of the fertilization and fragmentation of the various dis disciplines in this vast ecosystem of international law. The lowest common denominator in the fall lecture series is to enhance and provide a deeper understanding of international law through international lawyers. The Society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought provoking discussions, which will be the resultant of this engagement with experts aimed at exploring the vast ecosystems of international law. Our speaker today, Professor Dan Sureshi, is a veteran of many cases in international courts. He's represented states and persons in the International Court of Justice, in various arbitration tribunals, in the U European Court of Human Rights, the WTO, and other UN tribunals. In the area of international law alone, he has argued 20 cases and over the past three years as an advocate and counsel for states, international organizations, and corporations. His clients include 18 states standing in the field of international arbitration and was recognized by his appointment on the decision of the United Kingdom EU withdrawal agreement of the Joint Committee of December 2020 to serve on the list of arbitrators to hear Brexit-related disputes arising from the EU-UK withdrawal agreement. In addition to providing litigation services as a barrister and a Queen's Counsel from Essex Court Chambers, London, he also serves as a professor of public international law at a university extremely close to our university, University of Oxford. He's also a senior research fellow at Queen's College, Oxford. His books have been awarded the 2001 American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit, the 2006 American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit, the 2006 Myers McDougall Prize by the ASIL, and the 1999 Guggenheim Prize. He has also co authored a book with the extremely famous and renowned Her Excellency Judge Rosalind Higgins and articles on the discipline on resolution in national security law. He was elected in 2008 as a member of the Executive Council of ASIL and ASIL Council, Councillor in 2018. Professor Sarushi will be speaking today on international dispute settlement, investor state dispute settlement compared to the World Trade Organization. Professor, the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much, Ankit. Um, let me start by saying, um, even though um, I've co-authored something with my uh, former doctoral supervisor and, and friend, Rosalind Higgins, uh, it was a long article, not a long chapter. It wasn't a book. Um, 
So my topic today is investment treaty arbitration and the World Trade Organization, what can they learn from each other? Um, before I get into this, I want to thank the Jindal Society of International Law based at the University of Jindal and its founding president, um, Ankit Malhotra. I was also pleased to see that one of my former students from Oxford, Sean Starr, is now teaching at Jindal uh, Law School as an associate professor. Um, so that was uh, that's a nice link also. I want to discuss briefly with you then today the WTO and investment treaty arbitration, and in particular, what can both of these discrete settlement methods learn from each other? Well, the WTO and ICSID, I should start by saying, are two of the most widely used methods of international dispute settlement the public international law has ever known, probably uh, only with the exception of international human rights courts. The WTO dispute settlement system since its relatively recent establishment in 1995, has decided or is in the process of deciding um, just at the WTO panel level, 606 cases, which is a remarkable track record. While ICSID, as of 30th of June this year, had 838 registered cases under the ICSID convention and the ICSID additional facility rules. So by a very long way, um, WTO dispute settlement and exit arbitration uh, are the most widely used uh, international dispute settlement systems uh, besides, as I say, of course, human rights courts. Um, but the WTO is much more than just a dispute settlement system. And it's this institutional feature of the WTO, which is my starting point today. The establishment by states of the World Trade Organization at the end of the Uruguay round of trade negotiations in 1994 was hailed as a new era for international trade, since it envisaged a shift from the regulation of trade being conducted by states on a so-called trade policy basis, where each state sought to achieve or project power um, or, or interests in global trade using political and economic power, it marked a shift from that uh, trade policy uh, system to a rules-based system, which is what we now have under the World Trade Organization. And this shift is reflected in the makeup of the WTO, which consists today of two arms. It has two arms. The first arm is comprised of the large number of WTO agreements that contain a wide number, a significant number of substantive obligations. And these uh, obligations under the WTO agreements constrain member states in how they can treat foreign traders and their products, and indeed service suppliers, foreign service suppliers who operate within their territory. So that's the first arm, the set of uh, obligations contained in the WTO agreements. The second arm, is comprised of the institutional elements of the WTO, which includes, for example, the WTO General Council and the WTO Dispute Settlement Body. Now, there are two objectives of this institutional function of the WTO as an organization. So this is the organizational element. Um, the first is to ensure the implementation by WTO states of their obligations under the agreements. But the second is also to provide a forum, a meeting place, to hammer out further trade liberalization reductions, further reductions in trade barriers. So it also provides a forum for states to negotiate the further reduction, further liberalization of trade barriers. The WTO actually possesses a separate legal personality under international law from its member states. And this separate personality has an important consequence that the organization has its own institutional interest, what I will call the systemic interest of the WTO. And this WTO systemic interest, its general objective is to pursue trade liberalization by seeking the reduction and gradual abolition of government barriers to trade. That's the systemic interest of the WTO, to seek the reduction and gradual abolition 
of governmental barriers to trade. And the reason why this has been adopted as the WTO's objective flows from what is in effect the theology of the WTO. Uh, I, I refer to that loosely, but it's really the animating purpose and underlying belief of the WTO system, which is the principle of free trade and its underlying economic value of economic efficiency. So the principle of free trade is really the animating purpose and underlying uh, belief, if you like, of the WTO system. And free trade itself is based on the underlying economic value of economic efficiency. And of course, the idea here is that through free trade, only the most efficient producers or service suppliers will survive and prosper against international competition. And the basic idea is that free trade operates to ensure that each state's productive resources are being utilized most efficiently with the consequence that each state and so the world economy, so the idea is, maximizes their wealth. I should make clear from the outset though that the WTO and indeed free trade are not about the redistribution of productive resources or wealth between member states, but rather they seek to increase global wealth. Now, the WTO seeks only then to increase the size of the pie for all states without seeking to give a larger share of the pie to um, less well-off or least developing countries. There are, of course, a number of theoretical and practical challenges that have emerged to free trade in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, and I, I won't go into this in detail because it really goes beyond the scope of what I'm going to discuss in, uh, with you now. But let me just mention by way of passing uh, two issues that arise. The first is um, the, the principle of free trade is based on a perfectly competitive market, which uh, probably simply doesn't exist in practice. And this was demonstrated by Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, I understand, for his work in the area. And the second challenge to uh, the unbridled application of free trade is that, it, um, is that it, some people will argue that it leads states to try and reduce the costs of production in any way possible, the so-called race to the bottom, where states sacrifice protections and standards in the area, for example, related to the environment and labor force, simply to make themselves more economic, economically efficient. Another critique which is aimed more directly at the WTO itself is that the global, this global trade organization with broad decision-making powers and a binding dispute settlement system is now taking decisions which penetrate, some people say, too far into the national regulatory autonomy of states therefore undermining the previously sacrosanct sovereignty of the nation state, the power of the state, nation state to take decisions for itself. It's precisely as a counterbalance to this intrusive effect of the WTO into the national regulatory autonomy of states, that there exists a number of what are referred to in the WTO agreements as general exceptions, which are contained in a number of the agreements uh, the ones I'm going to be discussing briefly with you today are those in Article 20 of the GATT, the WTO General Agreement on Trade on Tariffs and Trade, which is one of the WTO's main agreements. And these general exceptions provide a carve out for states to be able to regulate in areas such as health and food standards, uh, national security and the environment without otherwise being held in violation of WTO obligations. So the way it works is a state may, in fact, be in breach of a substantive WTO obligation, but if the state can establish that it falls within the scope of one of these general exceptions related to these, these areas, specific areas, then it will not be held to be an overall violation of its obligation. I want to consider due to time, uh, only one of these general exceptions very briefly with you today, and that's the general exception relating to the protection of the environment, of course, a very important uh, policy objective of states and indeed should be for all of us. And this um, 
exception relating to the protection of the environment is provided for by Article 20G of the GATT. Now, it's the famous shrimp turtle case, um, which raises an interest, a number of interesting issues dealing with this Article 20G. In this uh, shrimp turtle case, the, US, uh, the USA was sued before the WTO by a number of countries because of the measures that the US had adopted uh, banning the importation of shrimp from other countries that had not been caught using the so-called TED, that's the T-E-D. Now, TED is not the name of a fisherman, um, but actually it stands for a turtle excluded device. So it's the initials T-E-D, a turtle excluded device. And for those of you who, are, who haven't read the case, uh, who, who don't know, um, a TED is a device which sits at the back of a shrimp net through which turtles can escape. And it saves the lives of a very large number of sea turtles, which would otherwise die in shrimp nets. So this is obviously a very positive measure that's been adopted by the US government. But under the law of the WTO GATT, um, such a measure which bans the import of shrimp, um, depending on whether they use this TED or not, um, has the effect of discriminating between states because some states, uh, fishermen, uh, fish, uh, fisher people use uh, TEDs, but others, uh, other states, uh, fishermen and women don't use TEDs. And so uh, the effect of the US measure was to, um, to be a violation of the most favored nations uh, treatment obligation in the GATT. And so the question then arose whether the US, whether this US environmental measure could nonetheless be justified um, by falling within the general exception in Article 20G of the GATT. Now, the difficulty that the US had in making this argument was to try and fit its environmental measure protecting sea turtles into the language of Article 20G of the, of the GATT. Since that provision, that general exception, doesn't mention the protection of the environment in terms, but rather provides that a state can take certain measures. And here I quote from the provision, Article 20G, it can take measures that relate to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources if such measures are made effective in conjunction with restrictions on domestic production or consumption. So it only related the protection, the exception to the uh, conservation of exhaustible natural resources. And so the question that arose in the shrimp turtle case was whether sea turtles could be characterized as an exhaustible natural resource. Now, a number of the countries who had brought the case against the US tried to argue that an exhaustible natural resource should not include living creatures. They said exhaustible natural resource include things like um, uh, gold or oil or some, uh, some mineral deposits, something, in other words, that was not living um, because living creatures these other states argued, are renewable because they can reproduce. And so they should not be considered to be exhaustible. However, this view was rejected by the WTO appellate body, which said, um, and I quote this from paragraph 128 of the appellate body decision, um, we, we do not believe that exhaustible natural resources and renewable natural resources are mutually exclusive. One lesson that modern biological sciences teach us is that living species capable of reproduction and in that sense renewable are in certain circumstances indeed susceptible of depletion, exhaustion and extinction, frequently because of human activities. Living resources are just as finite as petroleum, iron ore and other non-living resources. So this is quite an important finding by the uh, appellate body in the shrimp turtle case, because they are saying they're recognizing that in fact, even though uh, living creatures are of course renewable, they are through human activity, susceptible to be uh, ex exhausted and in fact rendered extinct. It was however, the subsequent finding by the uh, WTO appellate body that proved most controversial 
especially for WTO developing countries. And it was when the WTO went on to state that the words of Article 20G, exhaustible natural resources, um, were crafted more than 50 years ago, but that they must be read by a treaty interpreter in the light of contemporary concerns of the community of nations about the protection and conservation of the environment. And the WTO then went on to hold that since a number of international conventions, for example, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention and the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity, because these conventions made frequent reference to natural resources as embracing both living and non-living resources, this was further support for its finding that sea turtles could indeed be considered as an exhaustible natural resource. Well, it was this aspect of the WTO decision that caused uh, consternation amongst a large number of developing countries who launched scathing critiques of the shrimp turtle decision in one of the WTO's political bodies, that, that is the uh, dispute settlement body. These states uh, protested against what they perceived to be the judicial activism of the WTO appellate body. Um, and more importantly, they resented the shift by the WTO court away from implementing uh, the core WTO values of free trade and economic efficiency that I have already mentioned to what they considered was an overly broad interpretation of the phrase exhaustible natural resource to include the protection of the environment in very broad terms. Now, this debate is still very much live today in the WTO. Uh, in my view, the approach by the appellate body can be justified by reference to the fact that the WTO is attempting to provide a truly global framework for the regulation of trade. And that in so doing, it will be detrimental to the long-term viability of the system to try and constrain in an overly broad manner, certain areas of the state's regulatory functions uh, which governments consider are of vital importance, and the environment is uh, certainly one. The position, this position of the WTO can be contrasted with that of decisions by ICSID tribunals, which have great difficulty in recognizing the regulatory role of government in the area of the environment as a justification for what are otherwise breaches of treaties or more general international law breaches of more general international law. For example, the ICSID tribunal in the arbitration uh, Compagno de uh, Santa Elena versus Costa Rica, um, the ICSID tribunal in that case said that while an expropriation or taking for environmental reasons may be classified as a taking for a public purpose and thus may be legitimate, the fact that the property was taken for this reason does not affect either the nature of the measure or the measure of the compensation to be paid for the taking. That is the purpose of protecting the environment for which the, for which the property was taken does not alter the legal character of the taking for which adequate compensation must be paid. The international source of the obligation to protect the environment makes no difference. And the ICSID tribunal went on to say, that expropriatory environmental measures, no matter how laudable and beneficial to society as a whole, are in this respect similar to any other expropriatory measures that a state may take in order to implement its policies, where property is expropriated even for environmental purposes, the state's obligation to pay compensation remains. Now, of course, that approach reflects um, the law of um, in this area of expropriation. And it was stated and quoted uh, and adopted, in fact, by a, a number of ICSID tribunals subsequently, for example, in the uh, TECMEG versus Mexico case, where the tribunal rejected the, uh, the argument by the Mexican government that its actions should not be considered as an, being an expropriation under international law, since it was enacting regulation to protect the environment and public health. And in the TechMed arbitration, um, the tribunal said 
we find no principle stating that regulatory administrative actions are excluded from the scope of the bilateral agreement, even if they're beneficial to society as a whole, such as for environmental protection purposes. Now, this different approach of ICSID tribunals in not allowing environmental regulation to constitute a justification for what is otherwise a, a breach of a treaty or uh, international standard is entirely understandable because, of course, these type tribunals do not have in their applicable law an express exception in the case of the environment, as does the WTO in the case of Article 20G. Indeed, ICSID tribunals may, uh, for example, in a particular arbitration, end up applying exclusively the domestic law of the host state if the host state consented to ICSID only through a national law, or if this is what the two states who concluded a bit provided as the applicable law to resolve any dispute. However, this scenario certainly doesn't exist in the balance of cases, since one of the objectives of providing investment protections in a bit is to ensure that the foreign investor is not solely at the mercy of the host state and its laws. And yet the issue of what law governs the substantive claims being brought by an investor before an ICSID tribunal still remains in a number of cases a fiercely contested question, with the host state often claiming that its law governs the adjudication of the substantive claims in dispute. In the case where the applicable law is specified in a contract between the state and the foreign investor, then this will clearly be given effect by an ICSID tribunal. But where a law is not specified, or more likely where the arbitration proceeds on the basis of consent expressed in advance in a bilateral investment treaty, where no choice of law is made, then the outcome is less clear. Article 42 of the ICSID Convention stipulates that an ICSID tribunal in the absence of agreement between the parties on applicable law shall, and I quote, apply the law of the state party to the dispute and such rules of international law as may be applicable. And so the range of potentially applicable laws and legal instruments where there's no express choice agreed by the host state and the foreign investor may then include three sources of law. The first source is the domestic law of the host state being brought before the exit tribunal. The second are any treaties enforced between the two states parties to the bid, including the terms of the bid itself. And third, other such rules of general international law, uh, what we know as customary international law, which often contain in themselves significant and far reaching protections for foreign investment. Now, there's no express priority accorded to any of these sources of applicable law, but the question which arises in the case of conflict is which short source should prevail. And, and such cases of conflict are by no means academic. For example, a number of bits and customer international law provide a foreign investor with far reaching protections, including the right to fair and equitable treatment by a host state. And these protections and priority may well often conflict with the host state's uh, application of its own domestic law in a particular case. Now, in, in such instances of conflict, uh, there is a, a reasonably good argument that it should be international law which should prevail over the domestic law of the state, and that that should be applied by an ICSID tribunal under Article 42 of the ICSID Convention. Um, I simply cite here, for example, the LG&E Energy Corporation versus Argentina tribunal decision where it says international law overrides, as an example, international law overrides domestic law when there is a contradiction, since the state cannot justify non-compliance of its international obligations by asserting the provisions of its domestic law. Now, that's that may be stating things a bit, bit uh bit too broadly, but certainly in the context of um, compliance with the terms of the bilateral investment treaty uh, or other treaty obligations, 
uh, that is almost certainly the case. In, the, in this area of applicable law, uh, ICSID lags behind the WTO, since the WTO famously contains a single code of WTO law set out in various agreements that members have all ratified as part of uh, their WTO membership. That was the first of my arms in the WTO that I, I explained earlier. But in the area of investment, there have still nonetheless been attempts by states to try and formulate a common code or restatement of international law on investment in a single treaty. There was the so-called uh, multilateral agreement on investment or MAI, which was negotiated between members of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development between 1995 and 1998. When the draft of the MAI became public in 1997, it drew widespread criticism from NGOs and developing countries. And after an intense global campaign, uh, waged by its critics, the idea of, uh, of the draft treaty was dropped by the OECD. But the timing was terrible. Uh, but the timing of the MAI was terrible, and that's possibly a reason uh, why it didn't succeed. Because at that time, um, the WTO agreements had only entered into force three years earlier, and states both developing, and it should be said developed states, were only at the time slowly beginning to understand fully the ramifications of the WTO for their ability to regulate large areas of their economies and to exercise what they had previously considered core areas of their economic sovereignty. It was possibly because of this context that the developing states did everything in their collective power to prevent an MAI from being adopted by the OECD. Let me, um, let me move on uh, to discuss another topic um, that has implications or that has resonance for both the WTO and investment arbitration. And the WTO is what I would call a classic um, system of international uh, dispute settlement um, because it involves uh, states suing each other as opposed, of course, to uh, mixed arbitration, as we have in the case of ICSID. And uh, <coughs> but despite, despite it being a classic system of international dispute settlement, the WTO um, uh, departs significantly from general international law rules in certain areas. And one of these areas is the issue of remedies under international law. Now, by contrast, ICSID tribunals follow the well-established approach of public international law to remedies, as was set out in the very early decision of the PCIJ in, of course, the famous Chorzow factory case. Um, and of course, the Chorzow factory case famously states that reparation must, as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of an illegal act and re-establish the situation which would have existed if that act had not been committed. So it's the standard of restitution. And that has been developed subsequently by the ILC articles on state responsibility to say that, of course, um, uh, you should restitute either by providing actual restitution uh, or by providing compensation to the level of restitution. Now, that uh, international law standard has been, as I say, affirmed and applied in a very large number of exit arbitrations um, as the consequence that flows from the unlawful expropriation of foreign-owned property. And I mention here only in passing, for example, the decisions of exit tribunals in the metal clad in Mexico case, CMS gas versus Argentina, and MTD equity versus Chile. But this standard international law approach to remedies is not interestingly followed by the WTO, which views remedies as being only prospective and not retrospective. So the WTO system, dispute settlement system, will usually only require a state found to be in breach of 
WTO law to remove the offending governmental measure rather than to provide compensation or restitution for the loss caused by the breach. Now, the problem with this is that it encourages a hit and run approach to WTO breaches by states, since they will only have to withdraw the offending measure rather than, for example, pro provide full economic compensation, even where the state's actions may have driven a foreign company out of business in the, in the host state. Indeed, the position becomes even more problematic when, for example, a WTO member state may impose anti-dumping duties, which are essentially a higher tax on foreign goods being imported into its territory. And even though the WTO, a WTO panel or appellate body may subsequently find that this tax has been imposed unlawfully in breach of the WTO agreements, even in this case, the taxing state does not have to repay the unlawfully obtained tax, tax revenue. Now, as I say, the lack of an effective remedy in such cases has, has encouraged a hit and run approach. And this has um, uh, affected developing country members particularly uh, hard since historically they were often the target of such duties. So it was not surprising that Mexico proposed in WTO debates on reform of the WTO dispute settlement, uh, that the notion of retroactive remedies be introduced as part of the system. On this issue of remedy then, ICSID is streets ahead of the WTO, and it's one of the most important reforms the WTO could institute to improve the legitimacy of its dispute settlement system, certainly as perceived by uh, developing country members. I mentioned earlier that the WTA dispute settlement is a uh, traditional international law system where only states are parties to a case. In more conceptual terms, the WTO system deprives the substantive rights holders in practice companies um, from being able to enforce their rights against the foreign state. And as such, they have to depend on their state of nationality taking up a WTO case on their behalf. In the case of the WTO, the fact that states have to initiate a case often acts as a, a filter so that only those companies with sufficient domestic political influence with their state of nationality will have their case taken up in the WTO. More generally, this politi politicization of the process often makes the institutional cases more difficult than should be the case. For example, it will be a brave government of a small developing country that decides to go ahead and sue a powerful state such as the US or EU. And this position is in stark contrast to the celebrated position in ICSID, where of course private companies, the substantive rights holders, uh, can under certain conditions sue directly a foreign state who has consented to ICSID arbitration. In many ways, this is the ideal international dispute settlement system since the substantive rights holder is given the right to sue the state allegedly breaching those rights. An objection that has in the past been made against opening up the WTO in a way similar to that of ICSID is that developing countries would be besieged and overwhelmed by hundreds if not thousands of claims by foreign traders and service suppliers claiming a breach of the WTO agreements. In terms of the floodgates argument, there is, of course, something to that argument. In Europe, the European Convention of Human Rights allowed persons uh, who alleged their human rights to have been violated by one of the 47 states' parties to sue uh, a state in certain conditions. And the system was, for many, very many years, virtually overwhelmed by thousands of applications. At least in the case of trade, however, there could, unlike in human rights, be certain uh, significant preconditions specified to limit the number of cases. For example, there could be a certain minimum level of monetary loss associated with a breach that could be indicated as a condition, uh, together with um, certain strong notification and uh, negotiation obligations that the complainant company must have fulfilled. The limited role given to substantive rights holders in the WTO system 
flows over also into the area of amicus curiae submissions being made in WTO dispute settlement. Initially, the WTO appellate body in the shrimp turtle case allowed such submissions to be made by environmental NGOs, but after suffering severe political criticism by developing countries in the dispute settlement body, after the shrimp turtle case, the appellate body somewhat backtracked to a considerable degree, so that in the asbestos case, the EU asbestos case, the appellate body said that while amicus QA submissions could still be made, there were a number of preconditions had, that had to be satisfied, and it just so happened that none of the preconditions were fulfilled in that case. And this has now left the position as being that where amicus QA briefs are submitted in the WTO together with and effectively as part of a member state's submissions, then they will be considered by the WTO, but otherwise, uh, such submissions may well be problematic. This present position of the WTO on amicus participation in dispute settlement is somewhat ironic, given that an ICSID tribunal and the arbitration between um, Aguas del Tenuri versus Bolivia, um, the tribunal there, when deciding um, to admit a, a, an NGO to participate as an amicus, stated that the practice of the WTO appellate body supports, supports this tribunal's authority to allow petitioners to participate. Now, finally, um, let me turn to examine very briefly the, the question of appeal in a few minutes. In, in the case of the WTO dispute settlement system, an appeal from the first level panel decision to the appellate body, the WTO appellate body, is of course expressly provided for, and such appeals can be on any issue of law. This can of course be contrasted with the case of decisions by ICSID tribunals, which are to be treated as binding pursuant to Article 53 of the ICSID Convention, subject only to revision of the award. If there were important unknown facts that have only come to light after the award was rendered, for example, in Article 51 or subject to a procedure for annulment of the award made under Article 52 of the ICSID Convention. But in the case of annulment, the grounds are famously very limited. They are um, one of five grounds that the tribunal was not properly constituted, that the tribunal has manifestly exceeded its powers, that there was, that there was corruption on the part of a member of the tribunal, that there has been a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure, or that the tri award has failed to state the reasons on which it is based. In practice, it's not easy, but not impossible, certainly not easy, but not impossible to challenge an ICSID tribunal's interpretation or application on the basis of these grounds of annulment. There is a view, however, that though finality is one of the main advantages of international arbitration, that is for the savings it brings in terms of costs and time, it may sometimes come at the risk of having to live with flawed or inconsistent awards on the same or very similar questions or facts. This has led to serious consideration, for example, in a 2006 OECD working paper to institute an ICSID appeal system. But in my view, this would be extremely problematic given ICSID's current stage of development. ICSID arbitration today cannot be, in my view, considered to be a system with underlying values like the WTO, and nor does it apply a coherent body of jurisprudence based on agreements which encapsulate those values. All of this constitutes a serious impediment to an effective appellate system for ICSID, since an appeals body will in practice have concerns that go beyond the resolution of the individual dispute between the parties and it will try and formulate a consistent body of jurisprudence based on the underlying values of the system within which it is located. Now, the resolution by exit of the individual dispute between the parties, without taking account of such broader considerations, is a weakness of exit, but it is also the source of its greatest strength. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and I'm happy now to field some questions.
Thank you so much, sir. It was a riveting talk and very thought-provoking. It invites three thoughts in my mind, which I would like to share in the interim, invite others as well to share their questions. Before I begin, Professor, we've been asked in the chat box for sources and your reading material specifically. So now the, the ball is firmly in your court to share resources on your talk as well. Well, I, I can, um, you know, uh, given this is a public lecture, I, I think people can, um, can find, I mean, I've given the case names where applicable. Sure. Uh, three thoughts. First, which I would like to share is the, the reference made to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and more specifically to fishing resources and fishing practices. Now closer to home in India in, and in the southernmost tip it shares with Sri Lanka. You've shared the experience of a turtle and shrimp fishing, but here in uh, other cases of other, other fishing resources, Indian Indian fishermen use the technique of, of trawler ships and trawler, ve trawler vessels. Now that essentially eradicates the entire marine life and resources in the name of capturing the maximum yield. So, but, but then the, the only contradiction which comes to my mind is the region and the quickly re, uh, depleting resources, but the very freedom and which is enshrined in the nomenclature of the region, i.e. the exclusive economic zone. So there is an, uh, a value, undervalue attached to the region by its very nature of being an economic zone and uh, yielding the maximum resources in a sustainable way. Now, these are words which are, which would perhaps require you to do another talk with us. The second uh, uh, reference which I would like to share is the involvement of other aspects in, in cases of uh, multinational corporations and involvement of other aspects of international law, more specifically international criminal law. And I make a direct reference over here to the ecocide uh, uh, law, which has just been brought in as, as a new uh, part of the Rome Statute and one can also perhaps make a reference to Nevison over here, Nevison area case in the in the Canadian courts. I talk about this in the reference to the Costa Rica case, which you had suggested. Uh, and the third point, which I would like to talk about, is rather different, and is based on on research that I have done on submarine cables and international law. My question here is about a regulatory framework and the the pernicious tendencies of of a blanket regulatory system under the WTO. We've seen this discourse take place in the case of vaccines and uh, vaccination procurement, and also uh, them being shared with countries which, not, which might not have the resources available to them. So could you perhaps highlight this in the context of global uh, telecommunications, given the vast importance of submarine cables as being the nervous system of communications in the 21st, 20th, and also 19th century, given how long we've been actually using them. So I'll go back to you in those three questions. Well, well th thank you. Um, I, I'm kidding. I mean, I, I would take those largely as being comments. Um, on submarine cables, I mean, that's a very specific question, I, I, I would have to look it up, the, the, the answer to that. Um, but I mean, maybe you could take it uh, from the floor, a group of questions. And then as I mentioned, unfortunately, I have a hard deadline. I have to leave at, um, at one o'clock in London time. Um, so if there are any um, questions, maybe you could take them as a group and I could I, I don't see any here. If they do come up, I, I shall try and weave them in all together and perhaps offer them as one question. But I don't see any as of now. So perhaps you could just uh, start off with, with, with what I had in mind. Well, well, well thank you. I mean, I, I, as I say, I take them as really comments rather than questions, I get, unless you had a specific question. Um, just, just to really to say um, thank you very much for hosting me. It's been a pleasure. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, it's nice, nice to, to meet you finally over the internet. Um, but if there are no, no nothing else, as I mentioned, unfortunately, I have to, to go at one o'clock. We just have one. one. We just have one question by uh, Pushkar, and he asks, uh, based on your comments, the amicus curiae participation, both at the WTO and the investment tribunals, 
I wish to know if the proposed multilateral investment court would serve as a light at the end of the tunnel for increased participation of such amicus in cases involving environmental issues and human rights. Well, it's a good question. I, I mean, the answer to that depends on the applicable law. So it depends on what the underlying law that the multilateral investment court would apply um, says and the, the scope of its, uh, of its jurisdiction to permit amicus. Now, in practice, uh, in the WTO, uh, a number of states, not a number, but several states um, are now um, uh, per permitting reforms uh, that go beyond, sorry, not, not amicus per se, but that go beyond what the WTO itself do in terms of uh, uh, opening up hearings to uh, the public and, and so forth. So there, there may be some developments that a future multilateral investment court uh, uh, could learn from the WTO, certainly in relation to uh, transparency, but also possibly in relation to amicus. But that would have to be negotiated, of course, between those states who are setting up the MIC. Right. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It's been a riveting experience, an expedited and a fast track experience. And thank you so much for being here. In fact, let me just also share the, the senior brass of the administration is visiting my city and I've been asked to join them for dinner. So I was looking to request you to end the lecture early, but given how things have worked out, I think things have been taken care of. I am nonetheless thankful and grateful to you for sharing your expert thoughts and also precious time with us. Any last words which you would like to offer before we close, sir? No, no just a thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Bye-bye. Thank you.